The basic search was over in the previous session. But what I did was do another study because I wanted to see if that conclusion would stand further scrutiny and examination. I wanted to be satisfied deep within. So I did this study and I called it the sequel to the search. The first thing I did was look at those so-called unique factors, the non-unique factors that I had earlier put aside because it would not help me find the only way. These were factors that religions had said were unique, but when I looked at them, they were not unique. Another religion also had it. So I looked at them, these 12. A complete message, meaning it described not only spiritual life, but all the other aspects, physical, emotional, mental. Number two, faith and trust are big key factors. Picture of God, there we are God. Number four, incarnation, God becoming human. Number five, there being just one supreme being. <clears throat> and number six is not something that was manufactured by humans, but it was revealed by God. Number seven, it's beyond logic and reason. Not that you cannot use logic and reason, but it does go beyond them. Eight experiences are essential keys to really understanding the message. Number nine, all the descriptions of that goal are incredibly fantastic. I mean, the descriptions are so wonderful. Number 10, Blessings will be found not only at the end of the journey, but even today, while we are in this present life. And number 11, it's not just for the adherents of that religion. That message for the, was for the whole wide world. Everybody must look at this message. And number 12, the presence of miracles. All of them said they had miracles. When I looked at them, I realized that even though they were not unique, they were definitely very important. Important enough for the religions to call them unique. So I looked at all 12 and I said, why can't we make a generic religion out of this 12? Because all the five religions were agreeing, at least two at a time to each of them. So. I made this as a generic religion. It would have all these features in them, all 12. And then I pitted this generic religion against these five religions I was studying. And do you know, only Christianity has all 12 in a straightforward, clear expression. What a place to retrieve some kind of a conclusion, a, a list that I had discarded earlier. But when, we, when I brought it to the table, this is what it showed. If you want a generic religion that all the five agree to, then here it is. This generic religion can possibly be called Christianity. Then I went to the conclusions that we had made. They naturally fall into groups of three with the 10th one being apart by itself. So let's look at those groups. Number one, about the writings. The New Testament is the best documented ancient writing in the world. It is solidly historical in nature. In other words, it is not legendary, it is not mythological, and not only is it historical, it is the best attested historical piece of literature. And number two, the top feature that we saw of the writing is quite possibly beyond human capability. And that is that it was supervised for a period of 1400 years. No human can live that long to supervise one writing of a book. And therefore, the feature, one of the top features, is beyond human capability. So it is historical, beyond human capability. And number three, it is the only writing that has a challenge to test and see. Only the Bible's challenge is open and clear, and it fulfills its own challenge very impressively, which is predictive prophecy. And we saw that earlier. So can you see the internal consistency of this claim? It is historical. It has features that 
point to a superhuman origin, and it is the only writing in the world that has the courage and the guts to say, test me out. And if you test it, it passes the test with flying colors. Now we turn to the founders. The first three, Jesus dared to make the highest claim, son of God. Now the others also could have made that claim, they did not. And we had said earlier, when we started the search, that it would not be possible for us to controvert their claims because we do not have the position authority to do that. Because if we say we do not want this claim of Jesus, then we would have to be, in fairness, we will have to say that we should also discard the claim of Gautama Buddha being enlightened and Muhammad being the seal of the prophets. But we could not, so we have to keep it there. He made the highest claim. Number two, he did not just bring a message. He did not bring to us a description of the truth and the way and the life. He was the way, the truth and the life. He was the message himself. See once again the consistency. He came from there as the son of God. And when he came, he didn't have to say, well, I'll teach you what I got from somebody else. He said, I am bringing the message in myself. I am the message. And number three, Jesus is the only one in whom the theory of teaching was matched by actual practice in life. Therefore, the only one with the right to say, follow me, for I have set you a perfect example. No other founder has that right. So here's the picture. From there, God came down bringing the message in himself. And if he brought the message in himself, then we would expect that his life would be in line fully with that message. And that's exactly what we find. The only person whose life matched his teachings. So these place him at a very, very high level of credibility. The next three pull him down, drag him down to the lowest depths. Number seven, he is the only founder born not only in abject poverty, but born also illegitimate. So the worst start, number two of this set, his ministry was the shortest, just three and a half years. The worst start, the shortest ministry, and number three, the only founder to die the shameful, violent, humiliating death of a condemned criminal. The worst start, the shortest period, and the worst ending. Condemned, not just by ordinary beings, but by the highest religious authority, the Sanhedrin, the highest civil authority, Rome, and the highest moral authority that the Jews thought in this universe, God himself. You cannot find anything worse. No picture can be worse than this. So he's the best when he is in his good, and when he is bad, he is the worst. You remember what we said right in the beginning when we were doing this search? We said in the, in the process of searching, we don't have to look for the best or the person who's ahead. We just need to look at a person or a message that was so different from the others that it was all by itself. And here's exactly that. When he's good, he's so high that nobody can reach him. And when he is awful, he is so far away that nobody wants to get anywhere close to him. The only one. Different from all the others. But the tenth one separates and severs him from every other claimant out there. He is the only one to go into the domain of death, the most feared enemy of humankind, break the bands and come back as a conqueror over death. And not only did he do that, he left enough evidence for us 2,000 years later to scrutinize that report and look at the features and come to a reasonable conclusion 
that there was a man who died and most probably rose up from the dead. And if, he, if that is true, then he is absolutely unique, unparalleled. Now I went to then the book. This was and the man, and this was earlier a comparison. What would happen if we don't compare, basically don't compare, but look at the features. Here's a statement by Carnegie Simpson. Jesus is not one of the group of the world's great. Talk of Alexander the Great and Charles the Great and Napoleon the Great, if you will. Jesus is a part. He is not the great. He is the only. Wow. Really? The only? Well, if you look at his life and gather some features, I believe we could make a reasonable conclusion that that statement is true. Let's look at seven features. Number one, his unique entrance into history. His mother conceived him while she was yet a virgin. He had no paternal father. The virgin conception and birth of Christ is utterly unique in human history. The fact really is that the people called him illegitimate. Why did they do that? Because the mother was identified, the father was not. That could be a pointer that the father was somebody else whom nobody had met or seen. And in that instance, we could say that the story maybe is true. His father was the son of God. He's not a human. That is why they called him illegitimate. So that, that epithet, which was meant to hound and harass, actually points to the fact that what he said might have been true. So he was conceived by a virgin. Not only was this event so unique, the fact it was prophesied, it was predicted, behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. It was predicted 600 years before that a virgin would have this kind of an experience. Amazing. And the name Emmanuel means God with us. Again, it is in line with the claim. It was a miraculous event. And the miraculous event brought God down to this earth to be a human with us. The virgin is pregnant. In other words, despite the pregnancy, the mother is still considered to be a virgin. Have you ever considered how Isaiah would have felt in writing this down? He was a revered prophet, respected in his community. Why would he write down such a physiologically ridiculous prediction? Whoever heard of a virgin being pregnant? But he wrote it down. And the gospel writer said that that was fulfilled. So his an entrance to the human race was absolutely unique. Number two, unique in sinless perfection. Christ's self-conscious purity is astonishing. Nobody I know can look into his mind and come up with a clean slate from his conscience. Nobody, except this man. He and he alone carried the spotless purity of childhood untarnished through his youth and manhood. Fifteen million minutes of life on this earth in the midst of a wicked and corrupt generation. Every thought, every deed, every purpose, every work, privately and publicly, from the time he opened his baby eyes until he expired on the cross, were all approved of God. Never once did our Lord have to confess any sin, for he had no sin." An amazing testimony. Sinless perfection and perfect sinlessness is what we would expect of God incarnate. And this we do find in Jesus Christ. The hypothesis and the theory that we make compared to the facts, they concur. It is consistent. Miracles. All the religions claim to have miracles in them. We agree to that. But there are some vital differences, and I'd like to point out one or two of them. Number one, Jesus' miracles were seen by eyewitnesses and recorded and reported in the same generation they were performed. 
there was no time to sh bring in added descriptions to make an ordinary event into a supernatural event, like making a legend or a myth. There was simply no time. It was the same generation. And furthermore, they were witnessed. Nobody ever witnessed Gautama Buddha being enlightened under the ficus tree. He got up and said, I am enlightened. Nobody ever saw Muhammad getting his visions on Mount Hira from Angel Gabriel. He came down and told the people, I have been spoken to. This is the only writing in which there are people other than the individual who say, I saw and I'm going to write it down. Amazing testimony. Jesus himself performed the miracles, unlike Muhammad or, Mo or Moses. If you ask Muhammad, did you perform the miracle of writing the Quran? He would say, not at all. I do not have those powers. Allah gave it to me and it is Allah's strength and wisdom that brought this miracle. Moses, we see him standing before the Red Sea as if he parted the Red Sea. But what were his words? Stand still and see what God does. Every other founder claimed that they were miracles, but all of them were performed by another source. This is the only man who said, I am also part of that source. He could look at the paralytic, who he would heal, and he would say, I am forgiving your sin. He was a part of the source of the miracle. He could look at the corpse, dead body, and say, I am saying, rise up. Deal with the demons. I am telling you, okay, you have the permission to go. These differences clearly show that his claim was unique. Miracles are believed in non-Christian religions because the religion is already believed. But in the biblical religion, miracles are a part of the means of establishing the true religion. This distinction is of immense importance. It was the miracle authenticating the religion at every point. And if that was the case, then we would have to agree that the miracle was not just hearsay. It was not just a vague report. It would have to authenticate the belief. And so we deduce that those miracles were real. Greatest words. After reading the doctrines of Plato and Socrates or Aristotle, we feel the specific difference between their words and Christ's is the difference between an inquiry and a revelation. There were people who were asked to arrest Jesus one time, and the guards went there. And they came back without arresting him. And so the rulers said, why didn't you arrest him? We sent you to get him. They said, wow, nobody speaks words like he. And therefore, we could not bring ourselves to arrest him. He speaks words that are different, full of power. Look at his own words, Jesus' own words. This is what he said. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Wow. Never did the speaker seem to stand more utterly alone than when he uttered this majestic utterance. Never did it seem more improbable that it should be fulfilled. But as we look across the centuries, we see how it has been realized they have never passed away. What human teacher ever dared to claim an eternity for his words? Lasting influence. The ministry of Jesus lasting only three years and yet in these three years is condensed the deepest meaning of the history of religion. No great life after its close excited such universal and lasting interest. As the centuries pass, the evidence is accumulating that, measured by his effect on history, Jesus is the most influential life ever lived on this planet. Number six, he addressed deep need. He was not interested in the flashy stuff so that people would flock to him and praise him and lift him higher up and admire him. No, he searched for those who had needs. And when he was confronted with their needs, he did his best to address their needs. 
consider his words. If any thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Think and consider, my friends, what can be more basic to our lives than thirst and tiredness? These are the things he addressed. He addressed the naked heart of man and touched the quick of the conscience. And then number seven, which we already saw earlier, he conquered death itself. When he said that he himself would rise again from the dead, he said something that only a fool would dare say. No founder of any religion known to men ever dared to say a thing like that. We may safely assume that there never was before or since such a proposal made. When asked for a sign, and you know, in those days, if anybody of stature uttered something that was unusual, the first question was, why are you saying that? Do you have any authority to say that? And they asked Jesus, when he did his miracles and when he made his teachings known, they said, what is your authority? And he pointed to this sign as his simple and sufficient credential. And what was the sign? You kill me, I will rise up the third day. What an unusual sign of an authority. He who was ready to come to stake everything on his ability to come back from the tomb stands before us as the most original of all teachers. Amazing man. So is he the only? I think we've made a case. His unique entrance into history, unique sinless perfection, he himself performed the miracles, he spoke some of the greatest words ever spoken, and his influence is the most lasting, and he was not running after the flashy stuff, he was going to address the deep needs that you and I have, and beyond that, he conquered death itself. He has to be classed as the only. Here's what an anonymous writer said. 19 centuries have come and gone, and today he is the centerpiece of the human race and the leader of the column of progress. I am far within the mark when I say that all the armies that ever marched, all the navies ever built, all the parliaments that ever sat, and all the kings that ever reigned put together have not affected the life of man upon this earth as powerfully as has that one solitary life. Unique? Yes, Jesus, the only. And now we turn to the book. Is it really unique? And once again, we look at the features that this book has. And we will look at seven of them to see if this book is really unique. Number one, the way it was written, amazingly. In different generations, with different authors and circumstances, times and moods, literary styles, in different continents and languages. We look at each of those. Different generations. The first author was Moses, way back in 1400 BC. The last was probably John, about 100 AD, or the 90s. Generations covering 1400 years, definitely different generations. Different authors, more than 40 of them, with differing backgrounds. Moses was educated, he was a judge, he was a leader, Joshua was a military general, David was a shepherd, a poet, a musician, and a king, Daniel was a prime minister, Amos, a herdsman, Luke was a physician and historian, Matthew, a tax collector, Peter, a fisherman, Paul, a Jewish rabbi, and Mark, a personal attendant. They wrote in different circumstances. Moses, while traveling at the head of nomads, the bunch of slaves are coming out of Egypt. Jeremiah, while punished in a dungeon. Daniel, peaceful at home and also in a palace. Paul, in various towns, free as well as imprisoned. David as a fugitive and also as a king, Luke on extensive travels, John in lonely exile, different times and moods, Moses as an undisputed leader, David as an outlaw as well as a king, 
Solomon in prosperity and in utter dejection at the end of his life. Daniel, peaceful as well as perplexed, some of the times when he wrote, he didn't know what he himself was writing. Jeremiah, in deep grief and bitterness of spirit. Isaiah, in solid conviction and hope. Luke, in exactness and detail. Paul, in sternness and tenderness like a father. Different literary styles, storytelling, historical, poetry, romance, didactic, personal letters, biography, autobiography, code of law, prophetic, parables, symbols. What a spectrum. Different continents. It was written in Asia, some of it in Africa, and some of it in Europe. Different languages. In the Old Testament, it was mainly Hebrew with some Aramaic, and the New Testament, mainly Greek with some Aramaic. So when we look at these features, one word goes through all of them. Different. Different. In so many features. And yet, number two is that there is an amazing harmony. Single source of information, the Lord, over 1400 years. Single story and theme, single hero, lead character. Amazing, isn't it? Would a random selection of 10 authors living at different times, say over a period of 100 years, would they write on the same subject and have the same theme and the same hero? Just think about that. No work of fiction can maintain a single story and theme for 1,400 years unless it was supervised from beginning to end. Amazing influence. Since the dawn of civilization, no book has inspired as much creative endeavor among writers. No other book in all human history has in turn inspired the writing of so many books as the Bible. The civili civilization has been influenced more by the Judeo-Christian scriptures than by any other book or series of books in the world. Amazing preservation. Do you know this is the only book that a nation looked at and said we must preserve every bit of it and so they had professional copiers whose only job was to make a copy, an exact copy. Jews preserved it as no other manuscript has ever been preserved. They kept tabs on every letter, syllable, word and paragraph. Whoever counted the letters and syllables and words of Plato, Aristotle, Cicero, or Seneca? For 2,300 to 3,900 years, the text of proper names has been transmitted with the most minute accuracy, a phenomenon unequaled in the history of literature. We have to stand amazed. Yes, it may be safely said that no other work of antiquity has been so accurately transmitted, brought to us almost as in the state in which it was written. Amazing survival. This book is the only book to be repeatedly banished and attempted to be destroyed completely. No other book has been so chopped, knived, sifted, scrutinized and vilified and been subject to such a mass attack as the Bible with such venom and skepticism upon every chapter, line and tenet. Emperors and popes, kings and priests, princes and rulers have all tried their hand at it. They die and the book still lives. A classic example of this is that of Voltaire. Voltaire lived during the French Revolution. He was a brilliant philosopher, very popular a complete unbeliever, in the sense he was an atheist, and in about 1778 he predicted that Christianity and this Bible would be no more within a hundred years. He was not only well known, he was quite wealthy. He had a big house and under the house a basement where he had his printing press. That's where he got all his material out and the people just flocked to get his stuff his philosophy was gripping, and the people liked it, popular. But his prediction was that within a hundred years, 
Christianity and the Bible would be obsolete and in fact wiped off from the face of this earth. Fifty years after his death, an organization bought his house. Do you know what that organization was? It was the Geneva Bible Society. And they occupied the house and used his printing presses to produce stacks and stacks of Bibles. So it was supposed to be wiped off. They die. The book still lives. Amazing circulation. You know, when you look at books that become popular, by the time they read a circulation or a sale of 100,000, they reach the bestseller status. When they reach one million, it becomes something that you really put your collars up and you want to write home about. Boy, we've reached one million. When it reaches 10 million, boy, you, every, every mouth and mind in, 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 in the world knows your name. You become a household name and they're waiting for your next book to come out. What if it is more than tens of millions? What kind of a book would we expect to go into the tens of millions? I have a report from way back in 1998 about the circulation of this book, this ancient book translated into so many languages. The United Bible Society, Society's 1998 scripture distribution report, the total distribution of copies of the Bible or portions thereof in 1998 reaches a staggering 585 million. In one year, 585 million copies and portions spread out. What was inside there that made this such, such an impact on people? I'm not saying that this number keeps on going year after year, but that number is for one year. That is truly amazing. Translation. Do you know that the Old Testament, which is part of the Bible, was the first major writing that was translated into another language in history. When the Jews went from Palestine to Alexandria in the northern part of uh, Africa, they forgot Hebrew. They learned Greek. And they wanted their literature to be in Greek. And so the Palestinian Jews chose 70 people and they sent them down to Alexandria to translate the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek, and they did it. It's called the Septuagint. Seventy people did it. But that was the first translation ever made of a major work in history. Today, it is the most translated book. There are about 6,000 languages that the UN has described and listed. There are hundreds and thousands of them that have the Bible in that language. In fact, today the Wycliffe organization is working on 450 new translations today. And I'm sure many of them is complete. In other words, at this rate, we are less than a generation away from witnessing the world's first universally translated text no other book in history comes close. Can you imagine a text, a writing being translated into every known language on earth? And it's not some earthy thriller. It is not some flashy science fiction. It is an old book translated for today's people. What could be in it? that grips so many people to do such a huge job as translating it into every known language. So the three accolades in translation, this book, the first major work to be translated in history, the most translated book today, and the only text to be possibly universally translated. Look at the features, amazingly written, Amazing harmony, amazing influence, amazing preservation, survival, circulation, and translation. Surely, if you and I are fair, balanced inquirers, we would have to say that nothing else can equal this 
In other words, the conclusions regarding this man and this book have a credibility that is backed by clear and convincing evidence. Nothing in our existence can equal this. To make this as a stand is most reasonable. This man and this book must be considered unparalleled, unequaled in their credibility and in their force of strength to show us that they could possibly describe to us the only way. <laughs>